All right, let's get started. Today we're essentially going to be talking about new course content, stuff you've probably never seen before, mostly memory mapped I.O. and how buses work on internal on your chip, so stuff that was not covered in 370 in any way. Uh, so announcements, homework's due today. Homework three has been posted and is due next week. Uh, we have office hours on uh, Thursdays. You guys are, of course, welcome to contact me outside of office hours and request to meet. That's fine. Uh, you can also go to open hours if you want, or open lab hours. Um, they're probably going to prioritize people doing labs, but they're going to be able to answer general questions for you. And then the exam dates and times have been set. Uh, okay, and they're on the web as well. All right, let's get into it. Well, any logistics questions before we get started? Not one question, fantastic. All right, so today we're going to talk about memory mapped I.O., uh, bus architectures in general, and then the advanced peripheral bus on your ARM chip. All right, so we started lecture, or started the semester looking at this horribly complicated uh, diagram, and you weren't supposed to know everything in it. By the end of the semester, this will be too simple, and you're going to go look at the, the uh, embedded, or the actual uh, architecture diagram and understand it in your uh, data sheet. But for now, we're going to focus on how data is actually transferred from your core to your peripheral and to your memory devices. All right, so if you remember, we had this memory map, right? The, the ARM as a company has defined where certain regions of memory are, what should be in those regions of memory. So they said code has should be here. This can be on your on your chip. Um, SRAM, or that usually flash. Maybe it could be some other solid state memory technology. Is this guy locked in, locked out? You can go let him in. Um, uh, you have SRAM, uh, peripheral space has been pre-allocated, external memory, external devices, and system. And so we're going to talk about how we think about this structure of data and how it relates to things in here. Okay. And so what we talked about before is essentially these are distributed throughout your device. So system and code and SRAM are going to live in uh, uh, your SRAM, uh, your flash. You're going to have your peripheral spaces actually literally in the, on the peripherals uh, area. So those are registers, not necessarily memory locations, or sorry, not necessarily memory cells, as in the same as SRAM, but they are uh, locations where you can store data or read data out of. And then you'll have other things that live off of, like external devices and external RAM will live off the peripheral or the high-speed bus. And then specifically, if you look at the peripheral mapping, it calls out, look, GPIO A through C is going to be defined to be at these memory locations. Okay? Just like you guys have done through, in lab, you've looked through some archaic manual and found you know, some random numbers associated with where you're going to store that one or that zero to make the LED go on or off. Well, that was, that's memory locations, but they're not, again, what we're going to see is they're not really memory. Okay? What they are is they're registers that exist out there. You're just using the addressing scheme for memory to know where to write those ones and zeros to turn the LEDs on and off. All right, so we use other things too. You have external devices and a common peripheral that you could do is you could add in external memory. So you're going to use loads and score stores to put data into this chip. So I guess my question for you is, does that mean that there is, in the external memory uh, allocation here, does that mean that there's a gigabyte of memory in here? Then you just copy it over? How does that work? Yeah, something like that. That works. Any other ideas? It's pretty close. Nope. All right. I got a hand this high up. He said, I can't make it all the way up here. I don't want to answer questions. No worries. Okay. 
So it just would not make sense to have an, uh, a, you know, a gigabyte's worth of memory locations that then get mirrored over to off device. It's just not effective. So what they do instead is effectively, there's a little state machine, okay? The little state machine is in here. It says, oh, the, the core has put some memory, some data into a memory address range which I'm responsible for. So I'm going to take that, and then instead of storing it locally, I'm going to have another set of hardware that goes and transports that off device off onto my chip. Usually going to go through some GPIO pins, some other things. Um, but basically, there's a bunch of, I wouldn't call them virtual memory addresses, because in 370 and computer architecture, there's another allocate connotation of what that means. But here, there are memory addresses that don't really exist. So I don't have a better term for it, other than virtual. But there's a separate concept from virtual memory than you've seen before. And basically you're saying is there's a state machine for those addresses range, any address will go to the same, lo same location. It's the peripheral controller here. And it's gonna take that data and it says, oh, for this memory location, I'm gonna go pass it off to the disk. And if I need, if I get a, a load, I'm gonna go from the core, I'm gonna go and find out where that information is on the scan disk and then pull it back. So there's not actually that many addresses. It's kind of virtual addresses or a state machine. Any questions about this? From the core's point of view, has no idea there's a state machine there. Doesn't know. Core is just like, look, I'm a load store person. I load devices data in. I store device or store store data in. Load device data out. It doesn't know that there's actually um, a scan disk there or external memory. It doesn't know that there's a peripheral or anything else. It's just doing loads and stores. All right. Um, do you know what, the, yeah? Oh, so there's, a, that means there's a limit of, um, or maximum number of external memory that you can um, access? Correct. Okay. The, uh, so you only have 32 bits um, to define an address. So now we, that's gives us about four gigabytes of address space, okay? Or giga addresses, I guess. Um, and the ARM uh, architects have defined that that's the range for external memory. So that's as much external memory as you can have on this device. I suppose you could, I'm sure we can come up with a more fancy mechanism, right? Uh, you could have multiple instructions that index a page on a, on a table or something. This architecture is just not set up to do that. Any other questions? That's a good question. What would be another way to do this? How does does anybody know how Intel does this memory mapped I.O.? They don't use memory mapped I.O. They use something else. They want to talk to a memory or graphics card. Do we know the term for that? Fine. No worries. I'm, showing, I'm asking you obscure topics. Uh, it would be called port mapped I.O., right, where there's a specific port that does something. And they'll have instructions like send data to the video card, get stuff out of memory. Very specific instructions that are designed for a port the North Bridge on Intel or South Bridge on an Intel processor. So those are just a different architecture structure and where they're gonna say, I wanna have very specific commands and then they're gonna optimize more. So those commands only do video, only do memory, high, more highly efficient, but not as flexible. And that's okay for Intel, they only have one or two processors come out a year, right? They don't really care. This is an architecture supposed to be flexible for everybody, so they're not gonna go and specialize and say, oh, we're gonna have the scan disk external memory module, that's just too uh, or every individual memory module that could exist, they're gonna try to make something that's general purpose. So they're just gonna say, if you send data to these address range, we'll make sure it gets stored off device. All right. Um, so what is memory mapped IO? A method for interfacing with peripherals from, a, from the processor core. So it's just a way, or just think about it as the way we interface with anything off the core is just gonna be loads and stores. Now there's two basic types, there's stuff that's, there's a hard, ad, there's something there, there's a piece of hardware, there's a memory or an address, sorry, there's either memory like SRAM or a register, D flip flops, that actually stores data or there's a state machine, there's a virtual representation of that data. And from, again, from your point of view, from the programmer, from at least the assembly C point of view, it doesn't matter what that data is, it doesn't matter where, uh, where those addresses are, it's just loads and stores, at least I guess we could say from the assembly point of view. All right, so any questions on just the basic concept 
of memory mapped IO. It's just saying that everything that's external to the core is accessed through loads and stores. And it's your guys as responsibility as the pro programmers to understand when you put data into this address over here that it has some other connotation that it may mean set your GPIO pins to be inputs or whatever, right? That's on you, your responsibility. So any questions about the basic idea? Lively group today, no worries. All right, so we're gonna go on, we're gonna talk about bus structures. So bus structures, let's, I don't have a, we go back to here. Buses are the way we're going to get data from the core to anywhere else. We have a system bus, we have the high performance bus matrix, don't really talk about that here. We talk a little bit about the high performance bus and the peripheral bus, but the bus structures are the way we get data across our chip. Okay. So it's wires, sub-circuits, and a protocol that links two parts or more of the chip together. So there's a bunch of different bus structures we'll talk about, some of them in other parts of the course, but typically we're talking about parallel buses. So that means all the bits uh, are going parallel at once as opposed to serial interfaces. Serial interfaces we'll talk uh, later in the, in the course, that's best used for things going off device, and we'll figure out the reasons why you'd want to use one for off device and one for internal. Um, later on, but basically it's you have something that's transmitting and some things that's receiving. Typically you have multiple uh, receivers so that you can push data around. So what does that look like on a chip? So this is a 80, 88 uh, Intel processor. We see we have ALU uh, registers, we have instructions and decode instructions and other registers and a program stack. We need to uh, link all that data together. So what they do is they have these bus structures, and so you can highlight them here. So uh, not really in part of the lecture, but uh, red and blue are power buses, while there's 8-bit rainbow colors, those are the uh, data lines that link all those things together. Okay. Now one person had a great question a couple years ago. They said, why do that? This sounds hard. Stop making bus structures. Why don't you just put the two things close to each other and everything just works? Why do you need a bus? And what's the answer to that question? Does anybody know? Why do we make buses? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I would say no, sorry. This is a straight no. Um, there probably are good reasons why you might not want to have two things that are very noisy close to each other. I don't know if having a full bus structure solves that. It solves a different type of problem. Anybody else want to guess? Yeah, you need data in one more than one location. So maybe I don't have a perfect one that exists example, but imagine you need data over here, you need to access it there or there or there, right? It, you don't want to run eight parallel lines to each individual thing. Here you just have one bus structure, and as long as the receiver knows that it's their data and they should be getting it, then you can reuse that, uh, those uh, data paths, that, that silicon space. So really it's trying to go from many to one, or one to many. Uh, you can also to many to many, that's fine too. Um, the other reason is it's just not possible. I mean, that's the main reason is that you're trying to push data to different locations, but it's not possible to put everything tightly bound to it together and have individual paths for each one, just from a space efficiency reasons on device. Any other questions? Okay, let's see. Uh, maybe I have it queued up. A little false dad, just to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about. So here is a little counter, but it's not counting. Oh, I have it in reset. All right. This non-labeled confusing thing is a counter, right? It's just gonna count up in binary. And then, so it has a put value out, and then we just have a, a series of D flip-flops. Right? So this is a register, and it's just going to every clock cycle transport it over to here, and then you get to see what the number is. And this is not any more complicated than the mental model you need for this. You have data stored in registers, it gets transported over to another set of registers, and then on to wherever it needs to go. And in our case, we're might gonna have multiple registers, multiple peripherals on this side, collecting the data and doing something with it. Not much more complicated than that. All right, great. And for those that get real excited, you can copy and paste this false ad, put it into your browser, play with it, try to understand it, ask questions, whatever you like. 
All right, so, uh, but there's lots of PREF rules, right? And we just made a very simple model. Here's, uh, you know, data lines and a clock. How, what else do you need? When you guys can work together for a minute, come up with a list of what else do you need beyond data and clock to enable to make a good bus structure or a flexible bus structure that can send data to lots of different locations on chip? Go ahead. Specifically, I'm thinking about what are the other lines that need to be added to this, if any, I suppose. But what other lines would you need? Somebody forgets to like add ground, and they're like, "Why do my signals not send data from places one point to another one?" Is because you need a return path of current, or else no current goes through. So, need ground. Sure. In case things go wrong. You gotta know when the data is ready too. All right, what do people think? What are other control signals or lines that we need to, to make an effective bus system? Uh, maybe like, uh, do you want to make an input or output in the direction of the transition and also uh, which, uh, which element, which, which peripheral do you want to choose? Okay, so we, uh, it's true. We could, we just talked about transmitter and receiver, but you could have them bi-directional, so you'd have to have some way of saying which direction the data should go. Good. And what was the other part? How, how are we going to denote which, how are we going to put data on this bus structure or add things to the bus structure to tell it which peripheral to go to? What do we need? Okay. How are we going to represent that? More wires. More wires, right? Just go, you want, have an address bits, put more bits, more parallel wires to say what address it should go to. What other type of lines do we need? I know these three, they got it. And I, they told me already. Um, maybe like knowing what state you have to be in. What's that? What state you have to be in. I'm just using the slides. Oh, you're looking, he's looking at slides. Okay, looking ahead. Um, yet yeah, there are some status lines you have to be able to control it. What did you, you, I know you guys came up with some other ones. Reading and writing, like something to respect. Yeah, read and write. I think you guys also talked about maybe need a reset or an enable line, some of those things. All right. All right, so let's see. Um, typically for uh, buses on chip, you're gonna have something, you have some initiator, some target that you're gonna send to, you need some data lines by some dimension, some amount of parallel lines. In this world, it's gonna be 32 bits. You need some address lines. So you need to, the target needs to say, you know, if you're sending it to this target or that range of data, so you're gonna have a number of uh, data lines or address lines. You have a clock, some control lines. So you need to say whether you're reading or writing, if the data is ready, is, is it uh, uh, the peripheral's turn to talk, who's turn to talk? So you have some essentially protocol things to do. And then you're gonna have multiple lines, right? So the key idea is many of these lines are gonna be shared and duplicated. So this target's only gonna to respond to when the correct number of address, or the correct address bits are coming to it. And it may be a range. It may not just be one address per target. It could be a range of addresses in the case of the, uh, the external memory example from before. Mm, yes, I said all that stuff. Great. 
So to us turn out terminology, you have initiator, you have a target, you have multiple targets. Um, the initiator is usually the thing that is controlling the, uh, the transaction. It's very hard, well, it's not impossible, but it's more difficult when you have multiple things trying to control it, then you have to figure out who wins. And we will have a, a serial protocol that we have to deal with that edge condition. But in this world, you have one thing that's in control. Sometimes we call it the bus master. Um, typically, you have a target device that transmits. Uh, it, it basically, it's either transmitting or receiving, but it's doing what the master says, and sometimes we saw call that slave device, not the best terminology, but this was made by a bunch of white guys probably in the 80s who were not thinking about the impact of their naming conventions. You all can do better in your new jobs. You will soon be in a position to name things and you can do a better job than that. We just inherited this world, unfortunately. Um, and then there's some wires that are gonna be shared between all the targets and all the initiators and some devices that are gonna be very uh, specific. So let's go through an example here. Uh, nope, no examples for you yet, my bad. Um, sure. So the targets uh, uh, must only transmit when they're assigned to do it. Because you wouldn't wanna have, if you have a whole bunch of things on a bus, and everybody starts talking at once, you'll get bus contention, which means some guy's trying to drive a, a IO line, one of the address lines high, another one's trying to drive it low, and now you have a short circuit. You're trying to dump all that current to ground, you blow out your device. So you have to make sure that you only talk when you're supposed to. That's usually when the initiator is controlling things, they're putting out signals to tell you when you're supposed to control. Um, what you, the way you get around that is that you would have things that disconnect themselves from the bus, effectively going into a high impedance mode or a tri-state mode so that they are neither driving or uh, pushing current or uh, driving ones or zeros. They're not driving or sucking current in. And so you have to disconnect yourself to the device. And we'll talk about open collectors uh, a little bit later, but it's a simple way to do a tri-state uh, device where it's either this pull down, you can transmit a logical zero or nothing. We'll talk about that a bit later in the semester. All right, so let's talk about specifically for the Cortex M4, how this works. So you have your core. Your core says, okay, I wanna do this thing. I wanna do this instruction. I wanna store the value or the, ad, uh, the value in R1 into the address defined by R7. And so it sends this command essentially to the in initiator, which, try, which turns it into these control lines, okay? So what's the address? The address is whatever is in stored in R7. So you're gonna see uh, 32 parallel lines coming over, and that's a pretty easy to map, right? That's almost directly map to map. However, you'll find that the ARM spec says you can do the maximum of the set of 32 bits for an address, but you don't have to do all of them. In fact, it might be inefficient considering that you know your address space is not fully utilized, uh, especially for particular uh, peripherals. So uh, there's no guarantee that it has to be uh, 32 bits wide for the address space. In previous uh, microcontroller architectures where we could actually see right in the, in the details, it was eight bits. But for this class, we'll just say it's 32 bits. Um, when you do a store or a load, right, now you're gonna have control lines. This thing has to turn a store load command into a control line that's either high or low to tell the, the target whether it's gonna be sending data in or receiving data. Uh, and then you're gonna have data on the, the actual data that's held in R1 is gonna be on the data line if you're storing, but if, the, if it was a load, then the data's actually gonna show up from the target. So all these state machines have to interpret this code to set up the right lines on the address, or on the bus, so that we can send data back and forth. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I still don't quite understand what this state machine is, because I saw like, for state machine, it has like a bunch of stage, like zero, stage zero, stage zero, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. What does it apply to it? Um, we'll go through it in much more detail when we talk about buses. Um, but you can imagine it's state machine and or combinational logic. So a lot of, so some of these things like I was talking about turning store into a one or zero, it could just be combinational logic that turns your control line to tell it to transmit or receive. But so, so you're right. So it could be state machine slash combinational logic. There is a state machine in there. We'll cover it in more detail later. Ooh. From the core, um, I guess that's a fair question. Uh, I don't know. 
There's, uh, you know, what I'm trying to show you as deep into the embedded system as I think is useful for you to learn and knowing how the bus structures work, but then like going all the way deep into silicon and seeing what ARM did, um, I don't know. Um, my guess is it probably makes sense to do it here because then it's maybe that instruction's not part of this add, add function, right? You don't have to spend another cycle here adding, but it's really a hardware question. We can ask the hardware engineers the best way to, to do it. What other questions do you guys have? Okay. All right, so we talked a little bit about this, but you know, we're trying to figure out what the address range is. Uh, is it loader stores? We have to, this thing's generating a clock and the control lines, maybe reinterpreting the, the target address. You know, uh, all right, I think we covered most of those questions. Fantastic. Uh, and then the target is saying, ah, well, it needs to connect the data to some peripheral. The data needs to go somewhere, right? And so this thing has control lines that are essentially going to be connected to the register that's right there. So this thing's going to respond uh, by taking the data and putting it in the correct register. Or when you want to read out what's the state of my GPIO pins, are they inputs or outputs? Um, the target is going to go to those specific registers and get that out. And this usually will we'll actually show you a mechanism, like a hardware NAND gate style mechanism for doing that. All right, so before we go on, uh, the big takeaways here is you got a core. The core does not know about where data is. It's just doing loads and stores. If you want to get data to a GPO pin or into memory, then you have this whole bus structure in between. And the nice thing is by software engineers, if you think about this as all firmware engineering, you don't have to worry about this nonsense. Up until the point where you're running, where did my 12 cycles go? Because my, I, was, I put a load and I didn't get it back fast enough. Like why, why is it taking so long? There are some real practical constraints about why things would take long. And this is part of that. All right. So now we're gonna dive deep into the horrors of the A advanced peripheral bus light protocol. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole spec just like the ARM v7 architecture manual that you guys have seen. ARM says, okay, that's the manual for the core. And then ARM says, well, I'd like to make some extra money. And uh, nobody knows how to interface with their core, so I'll give them all bus structures, and we can charge a little bit extra. And then so they went and made a defined spec for their bus structure, and then they give you uh, the, all the uh, RTL, the code that allows you to implement their bus structure and probably give you some masks designs as well. Um, so now you have ability to send data back and forth. And actually, the bus structure is vital to getting the processor to work in any reasonable way, because you still need to get your code out of SRAM, right? There's, or, or Flash. There's, Without it, there's no way to actually get the thing to work. So the, um, the whole AMVA, whatever this is, advanced microcontroller micro bus architecture structure is almost implicit in the uh, Cortex uh, uh, product from, from ARM. Okay, the takeaways is there's a high performance bus and there's a low performance bus. The uh, big takeaways here are that the, uh, or sorry, the, the peripheral bus is connected to slow things. Slow things that like interface with humans. Humans are very slow things. And so you're here you're optimizing for maybe simpler interfaces, but also low, high latency. Well, the high performance bus is, uh, again, you're trying to get data in and out of memory as fast as possible. That's not a human, you're not waiting on humans for that. And you actually find that this, we're not gonna cover it in too much detail, but this uh, bus is pipeline. So you actually have a pipeline bus structure just like you had a pipeline processor so you can get data as maximum throughput as possible. Um, in our particular microcontroller that we're using now, unlike the ones in the past, is GPIO is actually on the high performance bus. That's just in case you wanted to push data onto some peripheral, some custom interface that you made. You wanna do that as fast as possible, they put it there. For many of, the work we do, it doesn't, like the lab examples in class, it's just easier just to work with the uh, advanced peripheral bus with GPIO. So conceptually it's the same, although this one has the joy of being pipelined, which is horrible. Um, yeah, and you can, this one you can split transactions up into multiple, basically packets. Uh, and this one is very, yeah, much simpler. The only nice thing, thing to think about ever in your project is that direct DMA is basically a controller 
that will allow you, like a second core that you can program that will do things like take ADC values and, and store them directory, directly into SRAM. So your core doesn't have to be doing that. It's like a very simplistic extra core. That's a useful thing to realize or to know is available to you for project time. All right. So a history lesson there. We're gonna be focusing on the advanced peripheral bus. We have a website. Hoorah, there's a data sheet. You don't have, this one is actually readable. The last one is impossible, it's only searchable. This one, you could read it. I don't really need you to read it. Uh, you should probably familiarize yourself to know how to look up data in it. I think it's only like 100 pages long. It's survivable. Um, we're gonna talk about some bus notation. So we're gonna show you a bunch of plots and graphs with buses uh, on them and then they use this notation. You don't have to remember it, just know that it exists. You got a clock, you have transitions from high to low. They're showing you here that there's ambiguity. You don't know what the signal is. There's some propagation delay. There's some period of time where you just don't know what it is. Um, this is saying that there's data on the bus. In a bus, that data changes, but we don't, because it's probably multiple bits, you don't know if it's high or low. Um, yeah, that's about all you need to know now. Okay. So let's look through what some of these bus signals would look like. So if you're advanced peripheral bus, you have a clock. Pretty, pretty simple, one data line going high and low. It's pretty much always occurring. Uh, clocks, uh, things are latched in on the positive edge. Uh, in the context of this class, where every, all the addresses are gonna be 32 bits, even though on your microcontroller they may choose to make it separate bits with that state machine that does remapping, but for simplicity it will be 32 bits. There is a write bit, and so the write bit is telling you, tells the initiator, is telling the, the target if it should be, uh, you know, one is we're writing data into it, zero is you're writing data out. So now we have that flow control. And then we have a second bus, which is, oh, we, this is the, sorry, this is the first data bus. This is the write bus, we're sending data to the target, and there's 32 bits wide sending data that way, okay. Some other bus signals, uh, bus selects. Uh, this asserts that there's a target and targets can have multiple addresses. So the initiator part of the bus structure says this is, uh, has a separate data line that tells which target should be selected. Even though the address space would do the same thing, it's another level of redundancy to say we're gonna select this particular target and that target may be responsible for more multiple address, uh, uh, multiple addresses. You have a, a P enable. Uh, this one, uh, P enable is enabling that the data is ready to go. And then P ready is the response back from the target saying uh, it is ready to respond. Right, so it could, it could be a case where you get a, uh, you send a target, you say give me an ADC reading of temperature or something. Well, it may take multiple cycles to get that reading and come back, and it's saying it'll hold this uh, low until it is ready and then high when it, when it is ready to respond, when the data would be valid. What are some other signals? Oh. Okay, so let's look at uh, what's going on here. So here we have, uh, we can, you can, now you're at the point where almost you can look at this bus diagram or timing diagram and figure out what's happening, right? So you have a write, when P write is one, a data is being uh, transferred to the peripheral. So that's where writing data into the peripheral. You can say that there's an address been space, there's an address there and there's data. So we're gonna push data in the peripheral. Um, the P enable must happen one cycle after the data has been instantiated. Basically, they're trying to say that there's this bus is very noisy, they're going to send data up, and we want to make sure that everything is stabilized. So you get a whole clock cycle to ensure everything's stabilized, and then P uh, enable goes high. That's telling the peripheral that yes, it's time to act, it's ready to act. Okay. That essentially that the data and the address are stable and it's time to do something. So when is the data latched into the peripheral? Anybody want to guess?
Yeah, clocks at rising edge. Four, four options, T1 through four. So you're, you got one in 20 shot, you know, of, of guessing here, yeah? Uh, rising edge on T2. T2. Um, great guess, I appreciate it. It's actually T3, and you probably should have known it, right? We're just, we're learning here. Uh, in this particular case, we had P enable. Uh, the data could be clocked in here, essentially, but T, ena T enable has to go high for the peripheral to know to latch in. It's, it's a signal, extra control line to the peripheral to say, okay, it's time to be latched in. So T3 is the right answer, but I don't really expect you to know that. Uh, yes. Says whether it's for this device, right? Yep. I mean, it's, driven by the target. it's driven by the initiator. The initiator has basically a table that says these are the targets on this on my chip, and it says if you're talking to this address, it's going to be this target, and I'll raise this line to tell the target that you should pay attention. Basically, it's kind of like a. You could say it's redundant, right? Because the address, the peripheral is or the target is responsible for a set of address ranges, but now you have to wake the thing up and it has to respond to you whenever, on every single address change, and that would consume more power. Uh, it would probably have other complications. So it, basically the initiator says, peripheral you, you pay attention now. The question about the address. Yep. It's so, it spans from like the middle of T1 to the end of the thing. Yep. Is it sending the same address over and over, or is it like sending a sequential this is all parallel, okay. so it's the same address. It just hasn't changed it. So it instantiates it once. It's not like it goes and instantiates the address, goes back to zero, and then does it again. It's just holding that data on that line. Uh, you can this no, notation says that this is the only time the address changed, and then the address was constant afterwards. No, it's a good question. We'll talk about it later. That comes at the idea of that. Um, P and A will go high saying that the, the initiator is telling the target, the data is ready, it's time for you to do something. It may take the peripheral many cycles to get that answer. The, in the toy examples we'll talk about in class, many of them were, were immediately ready. Um, but it, the peripheral has that choice to say, I am ready now with that data. It's a good question. Yeah. yeah? Um, so, so P select is one, right? P select is one, yes. Uh, we'll get to that uh, right now. These are fantastic questions. I th appreciate you from looking ahead in the slide and giving me the correct prompt to move ahead. It's fantastic. All right, so here we'll look at the wiring diagram and I'll answer that question. All right, so we have um, the P write data is a bus that's shared between, this is the, so all the outputs are on uh, the right here, all the inputs on the left, inputs on the left, outputs on the right. And so we have the, the initiator is going to have a bus, a 32-bit bus that goes to every one of the targets. Okay. Uh, we're also going to have some control lines. So here we have write, uh, p-write, p-enable. Uh, we have the address also goes to all targets. Okay. Uh, and however, p-select, there's an individual p-select line for every target. So that means uh, some architect went through and said, this is how many targets I have, this is the memory ranges for those targets, and then they, the hardware, whoever, you know, laid out a, uh, the, the wire for them, saying, okay, this is the wire that goes from my initiator or the bridge to these individual peripherals. So every peripheral gets its own p-select. And so when uh, the initiator gets a memory address, it looks up in a basic lookup table, says that memory address, range of memory addresses belongs to, say, target uh, one, and then it will select that, and then only then will target one look and respond to these addresses. Otherwise, it's constantly trying to burn power, trying to figure out if it should respond. What other questions we have? All right. Uh, we have a clock that goes everywhere. The one oddity of how ARM does this particular bus structure, and it's not the only way you could do bus structures, is that data being sent from the targets to the 
Initiator has its own bus. In fact, every individual one has their own bus structure. You could have had it so that these things are bi-directional so that somehow you'd have a control line that would send data back this way. That is another valid way to do a bus structure. It's just not the one we've chosen here. And here, so each one has a 32-bit line. So you imagine how many targets there are. There are lots of extra wires on this thing going back to the initiator. So anyway, can anybody think of a reason why every individual target has an extra 32-bit lines? Uh, that's true, and that's kind of at the core of the reason. But we could imagine some sort of protocol in which the uh, controller or the initiator says, okay, this target, you now have control over the bus, everybody else is in high impedance mode and only this thing transmits. So th there are technical ways to overcome that, but they've chosen to do this partly because it's simpler. But why, what's another reason, maybe a little bit higher level reason of why each device has a target or a 32-bit bus going back? Ooh, that's a good one. So it could be reading and writing at the same time. What about the idea of time? What do you think here? Yeah. Maybe I gave you a bad prompt. What I was trying to get you to think about but clearly failed was that these things are very slow. These are dealing with those human things, right? And sometimes they're waiting for a button push. And you don't wanna have to wait forever uh, for this bus line to get cleared. So if you only had one bus line, this initiator's asked this guy, go look for a button press, and that one is just looking for a memory address. You don't wanna have to have the bus line held waiting for this other human input while you could just go back and look for um, a memory address. So basically it allows peripherals of different times at different speeds to put data on the bus and then just signal when the data is ready to read. So that's a, just a, uh, maybe a flow control decision that they made. Yes? Does the P address line uh, really matter when the initiator is in reading mode or do they know where the data is coming from, like which target is based off which bus it comes in? Uh, but the, the target could have multiple addresses in it. Um, and so you could imagine when you guys are doing your GPL, right, you're sending in not only the GPL register, but you have another register for the direction. You have, um, I forgot them all, the speeds. You have you can, a configuration register if those GPL lines should go to like an ADC or SPI. So there's lots of registers just in one GPO. And so what would happen is uh, the select line would say GPL port A, you're now active, and then it would respond to whatever address you're trying to read in and out of, of that. Or A. What do you think? Questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, are, are all these like uh, PW data, all these uh, pain, are they like transmitting at the same time or uh, or are the P enable, maybe for example the P enable had to be on high first and then other pain can start? Well, we're getting to that state diagram I know you were excited about seeing. We're going to see at the end. but. Uh, essentially, it's all defined. This is the, the quick non-state diagramy way of looking at it. We're saying that all of, everything is trying to be instantiated in one cycle. There are situations where it might not, but here we have uh, the data, the select, the write, the address, all gets the instantiated one cycle. After that, then the tar or the initiator tells the target, "Okay, that data is ready," and then the, the target can respond. So a lot of those things are happening in parallel. Um, however, there is one enable should happen after all that's been done. All right. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, and then P ready. So each device has a P ready line. P ready is the target's way of telling the initiator that the data on the, the data bus here, on the uh, P read data bus, is ready and valid to be read. So you could imagine also that these things, actually, and they are, these are on different clock domains. This one's trying to go fast. This one can be going really, really slow. So you might have a 1,000 cycles go by, but your ADC or your GPO be, might be running much slower. And so you need some way to synchronize these two. And P ready is a way to say, OK, the data is now valid. It's time to read it. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go through an example here. Uh -uh. 
worksheets. You guys can play along. Okay, so uh, we assume that we have an ABA initiator and two target devices, and those are the address range of the target devices, and it's going to execute um, the following instructions. So it's going to store some values in some locations, and I want you to, oh, I need one more, to go through, work in groups, and try and draw out what those bus lines, control lines are gonna look like. And you got a little, a key at the next, next to it. You got the slides already. Here you go. Oh, only three of you over here. Here we go. Oh wait, did I give you the wrong example? Nope, I gave you the right one. Boom, there we go. So your job is to write the bus signals on D1 and D2. I forgot to label them here, but on your worksheet, it's supposed to be D1 on the top, D2. What are the bus lines that those two uh, peripherals or targets will see? All right, thank you. Do we have extras? Oh, those are yours, that's your essay, fantastic. So just to be clear, we have an address range, or should have been more clear. Uh, device one has an address range of 00-1000 to 0010F, right? D2 has an address range of 1010 to 101F, okay? So any addresses within those ranges, these are the peripherals, these are the ones that they're responsible for responding to. Dead silence means I'm such a great teacher, I can tell. Already with that dead silence, man. All right. So, which address ranges should device one respond to? Yes. That if it gets an address in that range, it will do something. That's the range it's responsible for. So, these are the data lines 
going in and out of those peripherals. And you're going to draw what that thing sees or generates. Okay, so let's, what's the, uh, for address, what is the address that is going to appear here, let's say? Uh, the value R1. Right, because the core got a store, right? Core got a store command. It's going out. Is it the address in, in R1? What about our pre indexing, post indexing? It's four. Right, so that's the address there. That's the address that that device is going to see. Which device is going to see that? E1 and D2. And D2, because if we go back to the diagram before, the address lines go to all the, the peripherals, all the targets. So they all get the same data. They all, sorry, they all get the same address. Uh oh. Okay. This is a one big so Would all of them be uh, uh, Would it be the same except for piece of the I think you're. Uh, I mean, I haven't really Oh, so where's the diagram where the wires are which ones are Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I 
because there's only a four time time, so I can use that it doesn't matter if you do it here or here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's come back together. I know not everybody got it completed, but that's okay. We're here to learn. All right, so as we, as we went through, the address is going to be the same for each one. So remember that diagram we had a few slides ago where it was an initiator and two targets, and there was all those lines going everywhere. I think there were red lines. The address goes to every single device. Okay, so that means, uh, let's, let's see if my builds work correctly. Uh-oh, nope, they don't work correctly. <laughs> um, uh, that means the address is the same. Why is it off set by four? Is because the instruction, right? How, how do we even get the address? The core is trying to store the value that's in R0 into the address represented by register R1 plus four. So there's the address, it's gonna add four. So now this is the address that goes from the initiator off to all the targets, okay? Which target should pay attention? Well, we defined it, and I forgot to draw your attention to it early, but those are the address ranges up there. D1 is responsible for the top address range, and D2 is the second address range there. That means that that is the address range which would actually respond, okay? This, that's, it's been predefined in that memory map that we talked about, okay? I see confused faces. Fantastic. Uh, there are some assumptions here that you would not know. So uh, one of them that is defined by the spec is that all the data must be instantiated on the buses uh, 
from the, from the initiator must instantiate it, and then the next clock cycle, p enable goes high, telling the peripherals that the data is ready. Now it's your time to respond. So that's why you have at least two clock cycles there for a transaction. We did not really talk about p ready and how long p ready takes. P adder is one clock cycle to get it ready, right? It takes, it was some unknown value, it transitioned, and then it became a value. It's just, it's held, it was held on that bus, and it can be held as long as the initiator wants, because uh, it wasn't, the, the target can do nothing until this value goes high on this clock cycle. This is when the target can do something. It has to be that this is high on the positive edge, and this data must be instantiated before that event occurs. I know it's subtle. You guys weren't supposed to know every single detail. Yes? Um, why does it end? For arbitrary reasons, because the peripheral device or the, the target uh, said it was ready and then it did inserted ready, right? So it, it raised ready. We'll talk a little bit about how that decision is made, but it could have held P ready down lower, longer if it needed to. So P ready and P enable do not have to occur exactly at the same time. The target. Yep. The, the default is one cycle. For, for this class, unless you're told you have a white wait cycle or somebody's telling you some reason why it has to take longer, you can just assume it uh, happens immediately. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yep. And so um, you can look, at, uh, it's hard, you don't have great documentation unless you read the document, but that, that plot that shows you, or the picture that shows you the, tar the initiator and two targets shows you all the wires going through, and you see that there's one P ready for each from the um, targets going back to the uh, initiator. Okay. Uh, nah. Um, bus high impedance uh, just means that the that nobody is control of that bus right now. The bus is open, right? Uh, transience means that some horrible bad thing happened on the bus and you have to avoid it. Um, it's just the same as it's an unknown state. Uh, what else is there? Bus high impedance, high impedance. Too stable. Oh, this is just coming back from high impedance to that. So those things are less important. I just copied and pasted it out of the spec and put it there for you to, for reference. Okay. I'll keep going with the, the example. So here we have address. Um, why? How do we know its p right is high? Why does p right go high at between t one and t two? It's a store, right? So basically, the initiator says, okay, we're pushing data, storing it into a memory location that is a write from the initiator's point of view into the target, so that's going to be high. If it was a load instruction, it would stay low. Um, some of these things, I don't see a good example. Like this one says, I don't care what it is. This is what this kind of symbol means here. It could be high or low. It only really matters in that location. Uh, okay, so what data are we gonna send? So all the targets, all the peripherals get P data, or P write data. They're all getting a coffee sent to them. But only one of them should pay attention. And how do we define which target should pay attention? P select, exactly. So P select goes high for D1, why? Because that address, 1004, is within the, the range of D1. P select does not go high here. Right? Which is nice because that means that the peripheral can basically just not do anything. No D flip flops go, no combination of logic has to go. It does nothing, saving power. Um, and then, okay, everything's instantiated here. P enable goes high. Uh, P enable runs from the initiator to all the targets, but only the target that respond, that's P selected um, is going to respond. And here it says P ready. And you guys didn't exactly know this, but P-Ready is immediately uh, available. So it says, okay, P-Ready, clocks in the data, and then it returns the bus. 
uh, or just returns, and the bus can go on after the cycle. Okay. What questions do we have? Uh, so, when the P, uh, PW data or MP write are happening at the same time? Because I thought like you had to, uh, the MP write should be start first so that you know you will write P data. Uh, and not in this particular case, so we're writing in, into the target, so initiator already knows this data, it's not like a clausal thing. And here we're just saying this is the direction and this is the data. That's all we're saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, nothing has to act on it until here. It could be that I don't know why um, it would happen. Maybe it was talking to a different device. You know, you would see data over here. I, don't, I can't think of a condition where it wouldn't be one after another, but I'm sure there's a good, there's a case when that would happen. Enable tells uh, the peripheral or the target that everything is ready for it to act. Because you, you don't want this going high here, and then maybe the bus has some transients and is trying to work on this unknown data here. Right? So it gives you an extra clock cycle. They're just trying to put more guard band in there, more protection to make sure the bus is robust. We'll get to that in a second. You could have a peripheral that can respond immediately. Totally, it's acceptable, and nothing in this example prompted you to know exactly when the peripheral would have responded. We would, if it was an exam or something, you would have that information. All right. Any last questions on this one? All right, that's good. Um, it's probably just important just to realize that these are the only buses that are different. P select and P ready are the only buses that aren't the same data for everything. Okay, so say we wanted to control an LED with the lowest bit of a register. So how, how would we go about doing that? Is that, I forgot, is that any question? Is this 42? Nope, all right. Uh, how do we control this? So, what do we have to connect here? What's what's something we have to connect to this register? Data. Data. Okay. Maybe it's even in order. Let's find out. Nope. Wrong. You're absolutely right. Here, I'll just advance through it. Um, uh, we have to ena enable. Know when to enable this D flip flop. So this is a register of 32 D flip flops stacked. Right. You have. Uh, we're going to have 32 bit or 32 bits coming into it. So this. The nomenclature just means it's 32-bit uh, parallel. And only when write enable, p select, and, uh, sorry, write, p enable, and p select are all high, then, only then would you be clocking in some data. Okay. Now we're gonna take our 32-bit bus and put it into the register. What else are we gonna need? We need a diode. So say this is off device, we can just put the lowest bit. So we'll, we'll denote the lowest bit by this putting a note here, brackets zero mean the zeroth bit of that line. We could have replaced this and had one D flip flop and then take the zeroth bit off the right data bus and put it into the D flip flop. All that would have been the same. All right, and we're gonna put a P clock in there. So only when uh, the right enable, the right direction, P select, uh, and the clock are high. That's the only time data comes in. And then in this particular case, it happens immediately. As soon as you've clocked it in, so we're just going to pull P ready high. P ready is always ready. It's always going to clock that data in. So we cheated. There's probably uh, uh, the hardware, the ECE folks will come in here and be like, that's not how you make it. You got to have like a complicated state machine. Make sure you're protected under all conditions. No, nope, no, nope. in 373, we just pull it high. We'll put a one in there. Okay, and then, so that's what this state diagram shows. So say action's gonna start on T1, uh, the address line, the right line, the P select, and P at data are all instantiated. P enable goes uh, telling the thing to actually now clock in that bit, and then P enable, this is, does not care, does not care, we definitely care that it's high, so P, sorry, P ready is high there. Let's define that, okay, it's actually high all the time, but under these conditions, it is showing it does not care.
What questions? I see I see questions. That's just denoting, you can't take 32 lines, data lines, and put them into an LED. I'll yell at you, Matt will yell at you, say there's too many data lines in one LED. So which LED line is it? You have to denote it to us, you're gonna use the zeroth uh, data line. So that's just denoting that the lowest bit, of the 32-bit data, is the one that controls the LED. Yep. Why have P address at all? Why have P address at all? Well, we didn't use it. Uh, I guess in this example, there's only one register for this entire target, so P select is sufficient. Should have told you that, didn't tell you that. Um, if you wanted to handle it, you could have masked it in some way and checked those bits and decided, okay, those are the bits and only respond uh, when those bits have been initiated. Uh, why have it at all? All the targets get them. Get that as an input, so we've drawn it here. Other questions? All right, let's see. Cool. Uh, so if we wanted to do uh, multiple register and one peripheral, so we kind of talk through that this is a, a problem here. So here we're gonna use, we have 2D flip-flops, 32-bit flip-flops, and we have one P select that's gonna instantiate this entire peripheral or target. However, uh, we're gonna have to have some masking for the address. So the, so say it's an 8-bit address, I, my, my fingers got tired of putting little bubbles and circles and stuff, so I just instantiated this is an 8-bit address instead of a 32-bit for this, you just call it professor's prerogative. So it's only 8 bits for the address, and here we can use a NAND gate with bubble logic. We click, take the bubble over here, and now we're just masking. The bit will only go high or low depending on what address is put in there. So then we can AND all that together, and only register B is going to be denoted by that address and only register uh, one is going to be enabled by the top address. So that is one way you could do it. And then you go in, uh, put your, ad, your data lines go to everything, clock goes to everything, and you can say that uh, P ready is, imme is immediately available. Whenever that clock strikes, it will be put in there and then the data is ready to go. P ready is being held high. Why is it depending on the clock? Yeah, like in this diagram to the left, is this always high? Why is this? A, why is it low? At why is it? Why does it look like this? Why do those bus architects you make this diagram and tick you off? So this is just saying that it does not care what the data is here. Oh. Only matters here. So it can be. It could be zero here. It could be one here. They don't care. It's definitely one there. So for you, uh, if you're drawing this, you can just do one all the way, make sure on an exam or a test or homework or something, I know that that's not zero, right, because there's no reference. So just say hi, there you go. Um, I don't think we're gonna get to our separate example, but you guys had lots of good questions, so that's fine. I will talk a little bit about P-ready uh, data, or P-read data, so this is the opposite way. So here, uh, the address has been instantiated, uh, is told that it's a read, not a write. The peripheral's been selected. All that data has been instantiated. Here, we don't know what the data is, right? It's undefined. The peripheral went high, or the peripheral is enabled. The data is valid here. Uh, the peripheral is saying that it's ready, and then at this point, it's being clocked into the target, or into the initiator. All right, so we can see in this very clever example, we have a switch. My predecessors felt Mr. Switch was very clever, uh, so I reused this slide. So you're gonna press this switch, and that data is gonna go into the D side of the flip-flop here. We've, we've just changed it around. Sorry to see there's an enable there as well uh, that got kind of munged with the font, and there's a clock, okay? So that data is gonna come uh, through that D flip-flop and be available on the P, uh, read data bus. And in fact, in this particular case, we're only defining the zeroth bit. All right, clock goes up. This is available at all times, this particular example. Anybody see any challenges with this? 
270 students may remember. It's fine. There is this thing called metastability. It used to be a much bigger challenge in their previous labs. When we use the old dev kit, if you weren't thinking about metastability, you would get all sorts of weird answers uh, uh, that occur. So here, you're not really tested on it. It's not going to be an important part of your labs now, but it's important just to remember what metastability is. That means that if you're transitioning your data during the clock, it is indeterministic what is going to happen, especially if you're here. It could be any one of those values, right? It is unknown. And so that means that the data may not be valid for that first cycle. So you may need two clock cycles for it to become uh, valid. And so the way uh, to overcome that is you put multiple D flip flops. You, it's called a synchronizer circuit. You just need to know that it exists. You need to know the metadata is an issue and you need a synchronizer. That's what you need to take away from this. And basically it takes two clock edges and you're guaranteed that the value is going to be one or zero. It is literally possible in this digital logic that you could have something in between one and zero it held in that D flip flop. As per the structure of the D flip flop, it can hold 0.5. And then it breaks everything else down line because it doesn't, we don't know what to do with it, right? So the way you get around that is with a synchronizer. So very clever people will say, all right, put another D flip flop in there. Therefore, when you touch the switch, it's not a problem. So I come back to you and say, is that okay? Right, we've lost it. Everything is a cycle late. That would be a challenge. And I would come back to say, well, maybe you need to change this guy. Maybe this needs to have a cycle late as well. You've put a, you've put a wait state in there. So just maybe you need to wait one more time, one more cycle to guarantee it. I guess I'd also point out that if it's a switch, do you as a designer really care? Right? If I press the button and I'm one cycle off, from knowing if it's a one or a zero, I mean, humans are slow. You just come back, you're gonna pull again in, in another 1,000 clock cycles, and from a human's point of view, it's very, very fast, yeah. Uh, never mind. Okay, great. I, either I confuse you so much, there was no question to be asked, or I actually answered your question. Two possibilities, metastable. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll try and get through one more example here, maybe two. So. Mm -mm. So we're gonna read from a switch. Uh, and so you want to be able, so say you have a program you're gonna try and say, uh, load in a value from a switch so that I know if a user's pushing, pushing, pushing that switch right now. So how do we do that? You have to put a mux, because we need to know which data bit to send back. Uh, the clever person would just say, just send, uh, switch one goes to the zeroth bit and switch two goes to the uh, one one bit on the and data bus. Okay, that's fine, totally fine. You're smarter than I was when I made the slide. This is just saying that you could have logic that controls which switch you're looking at. And so you got P clock, you got, um, you got a uh, synchronizer, and then you could use the zeroth bit of your address bit, because we defined it here, that this address reads from here and that address reads from there. So. Here, we're specifically saying that you have two different addresses that read from different bit values, even though, yes, you could encode both values into the data bit from one address. But just as the prompt of the thing, we're just going to say zero here uh, is select switch one, and then this address selects switch two. Ah, and we're going to use the second bit here to get four as that turns around. So now, uh, when you do the, the load, for that address, you'll we'll get a data bit back. Yes. I've done the the least amount of work possible. Okay, I am saying I'm only going to take the second bit out of that, which is going to be a one or a zero. That's the difference between these two addresses, just one bit, right? For right amount of binary. And then that is what's going to either put a one for switch B or a zero for switch one. If you are a silicon designer and you do this, I'm sure your boss will get very mad at you and say, why did you take a Lanson's class? But uh, there are more robust ways to do it. But from a logical point of view, that's all you would need to do. Um, I have one minute left. What questions do you have? can't have zero questions. I'm not that good a teacher. 
I'll wait 30 seconds. If no one has a question, I feel the need to point out that there's definitely a zero in co coffee in the hex during that function. And, or, uh, not a zero, an O. There's definitely an O in the hex. I just feel the need to point that out. That, 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 not a zero. that looks like an Okay, I will make sure to add a slash. <laughs> I'll add a slash so that O becomes a zero. Fair enough? All right.